Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Fairway Market, like no other market, a New York City institution that sells the best local, national, and international artisan foods for prices that can't be beat. For more information, visit fairwaymarket.com. You're listening to HeritageRadioNetwork.org, a nonprofit member supported radio station. We're millions strong, with folks tuning in from over 200 countries. We are education. We are entertainment. We are the future of food. May is our membership drive. Become a member and support us while receiving e newsletters, advanced invites, special discounts, and a membership card. We need your support. Visit our website and click the donate button to become a member today. Thank you for believing in us and enjoy the show. Welcome, you're listening to Chef Story, and I'm Dorothy Can Hamilton from the International Culinary Center, and we're sitting in beautiful Bushwick, Brooklyn, at Roberta's Container in the back. Come down and see us. And today, I'm really excited, uh, because as you know, I run a school, and I have probably one of the most gifted teachers, and it's not really even her uh, full-time profession. She's done it for decades, I'll say. And uh, she, and she does it really well, but she does it on TV, and she's done it in magazines, and she's done it in, in uh, for for really the world. She's probably touched more people. And I'm speaking about Sarah Moulton, and I know a lot of you know her uh, because she has her everyday family dinners, and she's got many. Uh, she was she started uh, working with Julia Child on Good Morning America. She's got uh, secrets for her weeknight meals that's on PBS that's running right now. But I think a lot of people know her because she was the um, uh, food editor and chef of Gourmet Magazine for decades. Uh, not only that, she's, she's one of the most iconic women chefs in America. And not only because of what she's done, she was the CIA's Chef of the Year in 2001. She's in the James Beard's who, who, Who's Who of Food and Beverage in America. Uh, she's won uh, awards from the IACP She's <clears throat> and from the James Beard Foundation for Best Media uh, Personality for Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Uh, but Sarah has uh, really, I think, contributed the most. She started the Women's Culinary Alliance. She's so incredibly supportive and has been one of the key people in bringing women forward in the food field. Enough, enough, Dorothy, stop. I give you now, Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. Well, and Dorothy, you didn't even talk about our history. I know. I know. I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll get there if we can. But welcome. Thank and you. Gosh, you have done so much. It's such an honor to have you here. So tell me. When did the budding little chef of Sarah Moulton start flowering? How old were you when and where did you where where was your culinary heritage? Where did you grow up? Oh gosh, it goes so far back, although I had no idea that this is something I should pursue until my mother figured it out after after I was done Who with college. Who listens to their mother? Oh boy, well I had no choice, but um way before that um 
my grandmother went to one of the Boston cooking schools. I don't know which one, not the famous one. And she was a very good cook. And she was one of those grandmothers that was a magnet for all of us. And we'd go up. She she had a house in Massachusetts in Ashby, which is this dinky little town. Um, my grandparents lived there. And we would go stay with her. You know, you'd go one, grand, one grandchild at a time or maybe a couple. My sister and I would go. And you'd go cook with her, too. So, you'd, you know, like other kids, you'd start with baking. So we'd make pies from scratch and cookies, of course, but we'd make bread and we'd let it rise in the attic. And um, we'd eat all the great food that she made, which was New England food, you know, pretty English, New English. So, you know, um, steam puddings and Yorkshire pudding and roast beef and um, Johnny cakes and all those kind of things. But that's sort of where it started. In terms of being interested, although I really didn't do much with it. But then, when I, I grew up in New York City, and uh, my mom was a very good cook, and I don't really know, she doesn't know why she was, because she didn't grow up really cooking. But, but her mother was interested in cooking, so she must she have was, eaten well. Well, she did, I guess, um, and um, she had friends who cooked well, but when she was in her mid-30s, She'd never been to Europe, and she said, finally, my dad was making enough money and she could travel. She's a writer. And so she went off to Europe with, not with my dad, but with my aunt and some friends, and she just loved it. So she started doing this every year. And when she'd come back from Europe, so now I'm in junior high school, high school, we'd have to make a meal of the country she'd just been to. So whether it was Spain or France or Italy, she didn't go to the Far East, so it was mainly Europe. And what did we use but the New York Times cookbook? And Craig Claiborne. Of course. And I find so many chefs, this was a very important book for them growing yes. up. Mm-hmm. So we'd make a meal, you know, veal scallopini like crazy and, you know, moussaka and all these kind of things. And um, the next day, so we'd do it on a Saturday night. I don't know how often we did it. Once a month, once every two weeks. I don't really remember, but I was her sous chef. And then the next day, um, Sunday was the only day my mom didn't cook. It was a free-for-all for all of us, at lunch at least. And so my poor dad would make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My brother would probably go buy a roast beef sandwich from the corner deli. I don't know what my sister did, a bowl of cereal. And my mom would have an exquisite pear and ripe brie. And I would take the leftovers from the night before and make something new. To this day, I'd far rather start with a refrigerator filled with leftovers than a blank canvas. I love them. They talk to me. Really? Yeah, they say, put me with that one. And I think that I, I need to be pureed into a sauce. So I'd make these concoctions and sit down, and everybody would look at me and go like, whoa, where'd that come from? <laughs> so I think that's probably when I started showing some talent, but I didn't, again, I didn't take it seriously. So I go off to college, University of Michigan, majored in history of ideas, wrote my thesis on Virginia History Wolf. of ideas. Yeah. You could, do, you could major in that. It was a, a bullshit major. <laughs> it meant nothing. Uh, it just meant you could do was whatever. It fun to It was do? so much fun. I went to this little teeny college within the University of Michigan called the Residential College, mm-hmm. which was part of literature and science and arts. But it was physically a building, and also most of my classes were there. And it was known as sort of the left-wing part, you know. like So we had no grades, just evaluations. So I took comparative revolutions of Russia and China and astrophysics and a class we lovingly referred to as boys and girls in books it was men you know women's writing men's room you know how is it different um and i grew up you know i I feel badly my parents paid all that money for out-of-state tuition but no isn't that what university was supposed to be about in your mind yes yeah i mean you know what i say and i i really really michigan you had other mind expanding things too well yes it was that period (laughs) it sure was we were experimenting but, you know, I feel like you go to college for one of two reasons, and the trouble is it's so expensive. So I don't think this is really as legitimate as it was when I was going. But mm. either to find your career, mm-hmm. which I did not, or to grow up, which I did. Mm-hmm. And so I felt I feel gro- that growing up part is really key to whatever you do after that. Duh. You know, mm-hmm. you know, you're know, you on your own. You have to make all these decisions. But I did have several cooking jobs. So I – Really? Yes. I cooked for another – family. Well, we I always cooked. Whatever house I lived in after I got out of the dorms, as a matter of fact, I became a vegetarian briefly. Not that I don't love vegetables, but it was it was a monetary issue. I lived in a house with three other women, and our Bibles there were uh, Diet for a Small Planet and the Vegetarian Epicure 1 and 2. Years later, I forget her last name, Anna... Von Bremen? No. no, no, it's not her. She's a great cookbook author, too. But the woman who wrote uh, Vegetarian Epicure 1 and 2... 
I had her on my show on the Food Network, and it was so exciting because she was one of my big heroes growing up. But at any rate, so we had a schedule. Everybody cooked a different night or two nights, and other people cleaned and blah, blah, blah. So we did that. But I also had a job cooking for uh, two professors and their two kids. I shared it with my boyfriend until he and I split up, and then I took it over by myself. But I also had a job cooking in a bar, and just walking around Roberta's right now (laughs) reminded me of that bar. It was called the Del Rio. And it was this hippy-dippy bar run like a commune in that we all made decisions about everything. But it was very loose and fun. It was a jazz bar. It was a beautiful old uh, space with high tin hammered ceilings. And on Sundays we had live jazz. But we were all like a family. I mean, we listened constantly to Bob Marley. I don't know why that was what we were listening to. And we had to break periodically to do shots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One love. Yes, I know. So, And the food wasn't really terrific, you know. Um, you know, we'd make these huge vats of soup, although I got quite good at it. But the base was that god-awful soup-based stuff. You know, mm. you just put gloppy spoons. It's mm. mainly sodium. But the rest of it was up to you. Mm. And uh, But there's this one thing on the menu called the Det Burger, named after this guy, Bob Detweiler, who was one of the cooks. He predated me, and one day he was bored, so he invented a burger and named it after himself. It's really quite good. It's oh, in, tell us. Okay. What the, well, the original was really quite good, even though it was awful ingredients. So it's a quarter pounder topped with the debt mix, which was freeze-dried green peppers. Did you know they even existed? No. You add water and they get resuscitated. So like you buy those in camping stores. Yes, exactly. Uh, we probably bought them in huge vats. Right. Um, canned mm. California olives, not my favorite. Canned Black mush- olives. Yes, black. Can- yeah, no, yeah, black. Sliced. Yes, yes. <laughs> sort of flavorless. Um, canned, I love many things California, but that's not it. Um, canned mushrooms. Ew. Uh, so that's the, de- that's the debt mix. No, they were pre-sliced, so they were oh, even really? more watery. They're really gross. So that's the debt mix, plus we, we cooked on a flat top, a grilled onion or grilled onions. So that's mixed in. So that's good. So you take the burger, the quarter pounder. It takes no time at all. And how do you know when to flip it? When you see little beads of redness on top. It's like when pancakes give you those holes. You Bubbles, know, it's, yeah. yeah, it's really gross. So that you flip it over. You put on the debt mix. You put on a, a American cheese slice. And then you pour beer over it. It's steamed in beer. And you put a little lid on top. They were absolutely delicious, even with all those gross ingredients. So in my second cookbook, I have the updated version with ground chuck, cremini mushrooms, chilies, um, kalamata olives, extra sharp cheddar cheese, and the beer. And it, the, the improved one is really... What do you use for a lid? Oh, you just... just, a, just um, you know, a pot lid. You know, you just get your pan, your your burgers. Does it have to be round over the? No, hamburger? because if no. you're doing it in a skillet, the skillet's already got sides. Oh, oh, oh. So yeah. You, you do it in a skillet. I'm thinking the flat top. Yeah, of course. No, I don't have a flat top. Although, actually, I do have some things from my grandmother, and one of them is a cast iron skillet that has no sides. No. It's like one of those pancakes. It's round. Well, you can't do the deep burger. No, no, I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't. But anyway, okay. so I worked at this bar, and uh, so that was my cooking job. And you just made deep, you know, famous. Well, debt, <laughs> debt burger. Oh, People debt. think it's deep. EBT, like somebody oh, didn't pay their yeah. bills. No, I, actually, I was known for my soups, oh. but uh, the debt burger is the one I really remember. So uh, I did that, and then I graduated finally from college. took me forever. And then um, I'm living in Ann Arbor with my boyfriend, and uh, my mother's horrified. You know, I, I pursued becoming a doctor, a lawyer, or a biological medical illustrator, and none of those things p- appealed to me. I should have become a teacher because growing up in New York City, I always tutored. I worked in, my mother worked in the, uh, was a volunteer for the school um, system and school volunteer program. So I'd work tutoring kids in second grade who weren't up to math and, you know, and, and uh, reading. And I read every book about how children learn, why children fail, all that stuff. And right. I, I continued tutoring in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I don't know why I didn't become a teacher. I don't know what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. But um, you're out of college, and my mother's horrified because I'm not doing anything. So unbeknownst to me... She wrote to Craig Claiborne and to Julia Child and said, what should my daughter do if she wants to become a chef? Now, Julia never wrote her back. Uh, I think Julia must not have gotten the letter. Did she write to Cambridge where Julia lived? Yeah. Because Julia was in the, famously in, in the, the phone book. In the phone book and listed. Yeah. You could call her in the phone. But yeah. I think she must not have gotten the letter because she responded to everything. Yes. But Craig Claiborne did write her back. And said, you know, if your daughter wants to become a chef, she should go to cooking school, which is something actually to this day I generally recommend for women. I think you need a sort of a slight advantage when you walk into a kitchen. I mean, there's some women who can just work their way up, you know, by washing dishes. But I think for women it helps to have a start. 
So um, he said she should either go to the hotel school in Lausanne, which is where he went, or she should go to the Culinary Institute of America. So my mom told me this, and I was like, whoa, you know, I didn't know you were thinking about this. But I said, what the heck, I'll apply to the CIA. I didn't want to go to Lausanne. That was too far away from my boyfriend. So I applied to the CIA, and for some reason they let me in, because I didn't even know how to use a chef's knife. We didn't do that to make the debt burger. Um, and uh, I went to my boyfriend, and I said, you know, I, I, I've gotten into this school, and I'm going to have to leave you, and I really don't want to leave you. And he said, um, that would be fine. I, I'd like to see other women, so please go. So um, that launched me out of there like a rocket. <laughs> And the second you majored in the wine course, at right? Well, by, by, by the way, that. I did get a hundred in wine class. <laughs> but um, uh, the day, you know, and then I, the day I set toe into the CIA, I was like, "Why did I wait so long?" Meanwhile, though, that man is my husband of thirty-one years. Wow, we were too young to settle down. We met when we were is, twenty-one, and you know, now. So I'm, did he go off and date other women? And then he, when did you? Oh, reconnect? he missed me immediately. I left him in September, and he moved to Boston to be nearer me by January. Meanwhile, I went off to the CIA, six to one, men to women, and they were all these cute, young chefs. I had a very good time. <laughs> we're waiting for the tell oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. Well, we're going to take a little break here, and when we come back, we're going to see what your journey was like to become a chef. You're listening to Chef's Story, and we'll be right back. I'm Steve Jenkins from Fairway Markets. You know, there's no more telling aspect, no more revealing virtue of a group of people having evolved in a lovely way than how they feed themselves, how they entertain, how they put food on the table, what they put on the table. Heritage Radio Network provides the clearest evidence that there's hope for us yet. Heritage Radio is like Fairway Market in that we both care deeply about what you're having for dinner tonight. Heritage Radio Network is not just about food, though. Every time I tune in, I learn something about things other than food, too. Architecture, design, stuff like that. But from where I stand, I still say, if you can't eat it, what's the point? For more information, please visit fairwaymarket.com. Well, welcome back. You're listening to Chef's Story. I'm Dorothy Can Hamilton. And remember, uh, it's membership month at Heritage Radio Network, and... You know, we don't we don't have any funding here and we really need your support. Please be a member. I mean, if you want stories like Chef Story and keep pulling people back like Sarah Moulton, you've got to support us. Come on, it doesn't cost that much money. Come on, cough up and um, you know, you'll never regret it. So, Sarah, back to you. Uh, so when you graduated from school, did you have what was your aspiration at that time because you're you you have such a um interesting career path did you know you were going to be on tv did you aspire because today a lot of people go to cooking school saying i want to be on the food network you sure know that don't you yes <laughs> i do i do but well, we won't go there but i i have a lot of respect for the young people coming in today they're they they are grounded they're, yeah. they're they're not all saying i'm a superstar right right um, no, when I graduated, it was a two-year program, and I did my externship in Boston. I went to see that nasty boyfriend, and I got your a husband. Yes, well, now my now my <laughs> lovely husband. Yeah. Um, anyway, I got a job working at the Harvest Restaurant, and which is the only restaurant I worked at. I worked for seven years in restaurants that's still standing, but um, the, the chef who hired me ended up getting fired before I got there. But the chef who took over took me in anyway, and her name was 
Lydia Shire. Oh, my gosh. My, my whole history is just filled with being in the right place at the right time. And she was great. I had the kind of training that most of us don't get. I was on the cold st- – I was hired to do the cold station. To this day, I'm ter- terrible at opening oysters and clams because I'm just – I was just so traumatized. by, And I have scars because mm-hmm. people come in and order, oh, four dozen oysters. And mm-hmm. I, you'd think I'd get good at it, but I mm-hmm. didn't really. I just um, – at any rate, but when I was done with the cold station, she'd say, why don't you come on over and hang out with me? So I'd go hang out with her, and she, you, I had that kind of one-on-one tutorial that you don't usually get, because by then it's calmed down a little bit. So she would say, okay, this is how hot the pan should be. This is the noise that the pan should make when the meat hits the hits the pan. These are the four elements that we're going to, the sauce, the wine, the this, the that, that we're going to balance in the pan. This is what it should taste like. It was amazing. It was only three months, you know, externship. But then I went back to school. And basically, my goal from the day I walked in there to the day I walked out, as I said, two years with that three-month um, externship was, I wanted to be, become a great chef. And I wanted it to be in a small restaurant. I knew I wasn't a volume chef. So I ended up going back to the harvest. And then I continued working in restaurants, um, for many years, and as ma- as often happens, unfortunately, to some of us, it, it sounds like it's an unfortunate thing from a monetary point of view. I was hired over my head, so I got my first job out of school was as a sous chef at the Harvest. Now the Harvest did 250 covers on a Saturday night. You know, we did um, amazing lunches. I mean, I remember working lunch, which is what I mainly did. Um, you know, with four omelet pans, making four omelets at one time. You could have them all right on the edge, and, you know, you have all your fillings, and it was really grueling. Um, but I loved it. I really, really loved it. And so I did that and then moved on to other jobs. And and then we moved to New York in 81, and I, when I came to, to back to New York, because I grew up here, I was like, okay, that's it. I am going to go get the big job for somebody else and learn finally cause, from somebody else, because I'd been teaching myself all those years. And um, I went to all of the great restaurants in New York uh, with introductions by Julia Child, because in the interim I ended up meeting her. And um, How'd so, you meet her? Well, okay. I was the chef manager of a catering operation in 1978. I was just 12, of course. And uh, I was peeling a million hard-boiled bag- eggs with one of my work, and I hated catering. I only did that briefly. Um, but the woman who owned the catering operation was a woman named Rebecca Karras, who also owned a restaurant that I had my sights on called Sibel's. And I did end up getting that job and becoming the chef of that restaurant. But at any rate, in the meantime, I'm peeling all these hard-boiled eggs. And Julia, as you know, has this way of cooking hard-boiled eggs, which is not boil them. Everybody does it her way now. So we were talking about it, me and this worker. And um, Barrett, her name was Barrett Pratt, said, you know, I'm a volunteer on Julia's show. And I was like, really? That's great. Do you think she'd ever want another volunteer? And Barrett said, well, we're just about to go into the next series, Julia Child and Work Company. Let me see if she's interested. So Barrett came back the next day and said, well, I talked to Julia and told her all about you, and she wants to hire you. I was like, excuse me? She wants to hire me? She's never even met me. She said, no, no, she wants to go call her. So I went down to the corner payphone, and I dialed Julia, and Julia did pick up as we discussed. She was listed. She's like, oh, dearie, hi, how are you? I've heard all about you. Do you food style? <laughs> now, back then, it, food styling wasn't the codified art that it is now. Um, you know, I, I was artistic. Uh, you know, I'd been a chef. I, I, hey, I was working at this catering operation where we did cold poached decorated salmon for 700 so although I had no formal experience, I, what did I say? What would you have said? What would anybody say? Yes, I'm really good. <laughs> so she hired me. And the reason the backstory is her friend Rosie Manel always did all the food styling, and Rosie couldn't make it till midway through the taping. And Julie assumed because I'd worked, at, I'd gone to the Culinary Institute that I must know food styling, so that's why she hired me. So I got the gig, and that started a lifetime relationship. Um, but back to 81, so I moved to New York, and Julia gave me introductions to everybody, including Andre Saltner, mm-hmm. who I now adore, but mm-hmm. uh, who's one of your main, your deans. Our dean, yeah, yeah just in school. Just he's, love he's it. Iconic. He's iconic. Uh, he is. And so was uh, Lutas. Yes. So I went in, and I, so I applied there, you name it, and they were all French restaurants, because those were the good restaurants in 1981. And um, none of them would hire me. And... After I went to Lutess, I actually, my girlfriend, Sandy Gluck, who was a chef uh, at a restaurant in uh, West 4th Street, took me in just to have a job while I was trying to find the big job. 
And I went back after, you know, this interview with Andre, and uh, one of her waiters said, why did you even bother? He said, I used to work there, and Andre's notorious he, for not, he said he would not, uh, he would close his restaurant if he had to hire a woman front or back of the house. Now, recently, this has come full circle, because as you know, I'm often a judge for your graduations, mm-hmm. and I love Andre, and he used to watch my show. It was so <laughs> cute. I mean, the first time I went up to see Jacques, because I'd known Jacques Pepin for years, yeah. I worked with him at one of the restaurants. I, you know, Andre, he's standing there with Andre and Alain, and, yeah. and Andre's like, I love your show. I just about fainted. Because here's this. Have I, you ever confronted him? I did. What did. And what I did, did he say? He was very sad. He said, you know, if I'd known then what I know now, because mm-hmm. becoming a dean at your school mm-hmm. and seeing what women can do. Absolutely. Has ch- turned him around. You know, it's, it's all you need to do is let a woman into your kitchen and you'll see. Right, what she can do because boy, can she! I tell you, those French teens we have at the at the International Culinary Center, they have opened more kitchens. They don't have to open them anymore. But yeah. back in the eighties, I bet you know Alain. Uh, there was one famous was, chef. He's he said, "I want to hire this." Uh, you know, at the graduation, this one dish mm-hmm. came out, and they said, "I want to hire that one." Alain said, "You are stupid. You're not going to hire because you are stupid." And he goes, "What do you mean I'm stupid?" He goes, "Because it's a woman, and you won't hire women." And that that was the first woman that that chef hired. Wow. So we opened lots of kitchens I know you back did. then. And I think it was, you know, just history that kept the women out. And thank God, you know, it was an evolution revolution. And yes. You were a major part of it because you were knocking on the doors. It took a strong woman to say, I want to break a kitchen, you know. Well, I want to break in and have women do this. Because chefing is a hard physical job, too. I mean, let's not, you know, there's a lot of women who don't. Over. Yeah. I mean, there's not, it's not made for every woman, you know. You've got to be physical. I, um, well, I think women can handle, I really believe women can handle the physicality. I really do. Oh, I don't think that's absolutely. remotely an issue. I think the one issue is having kids. Mm-hmm. I think kids need their mother. And, I, you know, as a feminist to the core, I hate to say that. I mean, if you have a delightful dad who's willing to stay home, I think that's great, too. Mm-hmm. Like Jody Adams, who's a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. You know, her husband stayed home and took care of the kids, and Jody was able to do what she did. Mm-hmm. But I think mostly that's the real big stumbling block, and that's when I left restaurants. But my experience, because I worked with all men. I worked in a French kitchen. Julia made me do an apprenticeship in France. I worked with all men, and that was wild especially because the chef was a dirty old man. Um, I've worked with all women. I hired them all when I was first chef, and that was a disaster. We all got on the same cycle and cried and yelled at each other once a month. (laughs) And I've worked with mixed kitchens, and that was fabulous. But Mm. my experience, and this doesn't go across the board, but with women, women are hardwired to multitask Mm -hmm. and to take stress. Mm -hmm. And I found the women to be far more even keel under pressure than the men. Mm Mm-hmm. So I think women let's are get great. back to the children's issue because, you know, we have actually at our school we have fifty percent women in culinary and ninety percent women in pastry. Yeah. So there are more women chefs, more and more every. And what is it? Can what what can you do about the ch- child issue? Because it, it hits at the peak of your career, thirty five, forty. Exactly. You know, that you you really feel you have to be at home or because the is it the hours because there are a lot of working women yeah so are are there you went to gourmet well that's one of the reasons i went to gourmet that's absolutely the reason i went to gourmet i I, first i was doing freelance recipe testing that only lasted about three months because i had friends at gourmet because we founded the new york women's culinary alliance with a hardcore bunch so i'd gotten to know them all right and um that's why I did that, because it was a 9 to 5 Monday through Friday job. But first I worked in the test kitchen, and that was not being a chef. Um, and then I ended up as chef at the ex- uh, executive dining room, mm-hmm. and that was a chef job, but it's like a corporate chef job. There are chef jobs with normal hours, mm-hmm. which is where I think women... You know the one I love right now? They're hiring chefs in schools. Yes. Not just warming ovens. Yes. And, and they are incredibly compatible with being a mother of course because you know right yes yeah that's so smart um i think that's the only solution i mean to you know women make it happen and, and i think one of the reasons things changed in in new york because new york people it was notorious people were always like where are the women chefs where are the women chefs and i knew where the women chefs where they were kept out by the french chefs and i'm a huge francophile so mm-hmm. for me to say that you know i felt it mm-hmm. but when the french chefs stopped being the dominant chefs mm-hmm. in the city mm-hmm. and when we had more and more american trained chefs mm-hmm. coming out of great schools mm-hmm. then everything changed mm-hmm. you know i always used to say to young 
young women, go west in the beginning. Go west, young lady. Because mm-hmm. California's al- always been far nicer sure. to women. Alice, Barbara Trapp. Of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even the male chefs in, in California are far more accepting mm-hmm. than they were in New York. But now everything's changed. But I still feel that either you have to have a job with fewer hours mm-hmm. or you have to have a husband or a, a partner mm-hmm. who will stay home and take mm-hmm. care of the kids because kids mm-hmm. need that. I really believe that. They mm-hmm. need that kind of care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue and not one that we're going to shrink from. And no. I think the Women's Culinary Alliance helps uh, the, the sisterhood of how do you, how do you handle that right. and have a full life. Right, and, right. Uh, so um, we're going to take another little break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what you're doing right now. Okay. Welcome back. And that was Andrew White on the guitar, my friend from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Um, And we're talking today to Sarah Moulton, and we just went through a little bit of memory lane, how the kitchens in New York especially, but around the country, weren't so um, really kind to women. But today they, you know, thank God, that's past history. I just want to bring up that, um, you know, the, the Culinary Center was the French Culinary Institute until we started adding other programs. And I don't think I would have met Julia Child without you, Sarah. The first week, I, we were open, actually. In 1984, we, I opened the French Culinary Institute with 11 students. I had put an ad in the New York Times like for a month before with the Statue of Liberty and said, another great gift from France. And you saw it. And you called Julia and said, there's a French school opening in New York. And you called me and said, can I bring Julia Child? I couldn't believe it. The first week we were open. And it was quite a story. But you you introduced me. You brought Paul and Julia and everybody. I mean, it was quite, and we had quite a lunch. And the rest was history. So thank you for that. I've never been able to thank you properly. I want to thank you on the air. Um, that that was a turning point and an inspiration. And she, as you know, Julia was, in, let's spend a couple of minutes on how important Julia was for women chefs. So important. I mean, but so for, actually for every chef. Mm-hmm. I mean, she said she wasn't a chef. Mm -hmm. But yet, my God, did she have skills. Mm. So she was a great inspiration. And she encouraged young people, and particularly women. Uh, Boy, she loved men. We both know that. She flirted like crazy (laughs) with any man, anywhere. Oh, come on. She even had a boyfriend. After Paul. After Paul, you know, well into her 80s. She was smooching away. Yes. (laughs) Um, But uh, no, but she was very encouraging. I remember, you know, I think it's her fault that I've always had more than one job, you know, because she's like, oh, dearie, you know, you should go, go do that. That too, or take this. I mean, actually, when um, Chez Panisse was, you know, I guess again, like the early 80s, she's like, oh, you should go out and work at Chez Panisse, you know, I'll give you an introduction. That was the one place I said no because I'd finally settled in New York, but she's very encouraging. And um, even though she had that funny voice and that funny manner, you could tell that she really knew what she was doing. So mm. she was a great inspiration. Mm. She was very disciplined. Yes. Yeah. So let's get on. Let, how did you become this great TV star hostess? I mean, I meet so many people that say, I love Sarah. You know, when you talk about TV, and you, you are the most accessible. It's very hard on, on TV to be warm and accessible. And I think you just, you know, you're just like a 
comfort food on. Well, you're so sweet. Thank you, because that's how I want to come off. Um, I never wanted to be in front of the camera. I worked for Julia on that show, and then I worked with her at Good Morning America from the late 80s all the way to the mid-90s. And um, that's why, actually, the Food Network reached out to me, because they knew I ran the kitchen at Good Morning America. Because I didn't just work with her. I worked with everybody. Mm. I did all the prep and and sometimes produced the segment because the producer couldn't be there. Mm. Uh, But I never wanted to be in front of the camera. And then when the Food Network started, they asked me to do a test for how to boil water. And I did, and I was terrible because I was alone in front How of the camera. Boil water. Oh, that was a show that we had three and in, four incarnations on the Food Network, and so. But the Food Network in the early days was desperate. This is their twentieth anniversary year uh, in the fall, and they were desperate, so they just reached out to anybody they could, and um, so they came back to me again and said, "Would you do Chef du Jour?" And um, I got media training for that. And uh, what really helped me in media training, it took like three days to get me to lighten up or loosen up or relax in front of the camera. Because being alone in front of a camera is hard. When you're on with a host, it's easy. So uh, what the trainer did is got me to figure out why I should be on TV. He said, come on, there's got to be a reason. And I thought and I thought and I thought. And finally I thought, I'm a really good teacher. I taught at Peter Comp's New York Cooking School, which is now called ICE, in the mid-'80s. And... um, I really loved it. Back to I should have become an elementary school teacher. And so I thought, okay, if I have a mission, I can get past the camera. And my mission is to help the home cook get dinner on the table during the work week. So that's how it started. But then nobody else on the Food Network, I am sure of this, got as much training on the job as I did because I did a live call-in show. So the first week I was really awful. The second week I was slightly better. By six months I was really getting much better. You know, sheer, you know, re- re- repetition. If you do an Practice hour-long show, perfect. five nights a week, you gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta get better. Mm-hmm. But also because I talked to people, so that helped to get the camera to go away because it was a call-in mm-hmm. show. So people mm-hmm. would call in with their questions. I didn't feel like I was alone. Mm-hmm. So, do you, you still enjoy doing TV? I love doing TV. Again, what do you like about it? The teaching aspect. Um, it's like magic tricks. There's so much about cooking. And I don't mean the fancy stuff. I mean even the simple stuff. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the magic tricks has to do with a gadget that you like. Like I use the grating disc of my food processor all the time so that we can eat beets in six minutes. You know, sometimes it's a gadget. Sometimes it's an ingredient. Sometimes it's a technique. Sometimes it's planning. I love sharing all of that. I feel it's very exciting. And when I find something like that on Facebook or Twitter, I, I love it. It's, it's like, wow, isn't this cool? How do you think you you were on TV before TV exploded? Food TV before the Food Network. You were with Julia on Good Morning America, and you know you would be featured sometimes with her. You know, um, what do you think? What do you think the Food Network has done to the food world? I think it's done fantastic things. I, it's gotten young people cooking. That's true. Kids are really interested in food. Um, you know, when I first was on the Food Network, I started in April 2nd, 1996. And, you know, sometimes we'd had to go out and do demos on behalf of the Food Network. And you talk, or even on air, I'd talk about ingredients like panko breadcrumbs or um, a fish spatula or chipotles and adobo. And, and nobody knew what it was. Now it's like they're all yawning. Tell me something new. People, at least they talk the talk, whether they actually walk the walk, whether they actually cook or not home cooks, I don't know. I hope they are. But we have, you know, and also the Internet, of course, helped. But people know so much more about cooking and so much more about technique. Um, And it's, we both would agree, it's so much more valued than it was as a career. Of course, there's the downside, which we mentioned a few minutes ago, about, you know, people just thinking, they just want to go on food TV to be famous, not because they really care about food. And that's distressing. But mostly I think the Food Network has been amazingly wonderful mm-hmm. for our awakening as a country mm-hmm. about food. Mm-hmm. I, I, I totally agree with you. So so tell me in uh, tell me about your locavore. Um, okay, well, yes, contest. thank you for bringing Here. that up. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, you know, I have a public television show called Sarah's Weeknight Meals, and we just finished season three. And one of our sponsors is Subaru, and um, we're, you know, we're going to do a pro- we're doing this project with them, and it was their idea actually. Uh, they're a very elegant company to do a locavore contest. So what it is is we tell ch- people what locavore means. Yes, we really should because <laughs> when we first talked about this, it was on. Um, whatever, um, 
Earth Day at the farmer's market, and I realize not everybody knows what that means. It means local seasonal ingredients you get. I mean, sometimes people say within a 20-mile, or is it a 50-mile radius? 50, I think. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, I'm not that literal because I'm never going to give up lemons or olive oil or Parmesan cheese. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, what we really mean is is trying to, you know, source your ingredients locally. It doesn't have to be organic. I mean, organic's good, but it's expensive. But if you buy something local, at least it's going to be fresher. It hasn't been bred to travel a million miles. And buy it in season. Food's best in season. We should not be eating asparagus in you know, uh, December. It's come from far away, you know, the whole green issue there. But so we mean local seasonal is really what we mean, mean loosely. So we're, we're asking people to enter their original recipe and, um, you know, a story, um, a photo, even a video if they want about the recipe. And it doesn't have to be even traditionally written. It could just even be a, a told recipe. Um, and then enter it. Uh, they go to saramolton.com, S-A-R-A-M-O-U-L-T-O-N.com forward slash Facebook is where you'll find it. And it goes till June 21st. And if you win, and I'm going to be the person who's going to decide with a few of my friends who work on the show, then I will come and cook with you. Wow. And we are going what to... What if you live in, you know, I think British it, Columbia? Uh, no, it has to be in the f- the 48 oh, okay. lower sta- <laughs> states. But yeah. if you're in North Dakota? Uh, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm not going to Alaska, Hawaii. Damn. But, um, uh, but I because will, you can't drive a Subaru. There. Yeah, well, this is true. Uh, but at any rate, so then I will come and cook with you, and we're going to videotape it, and we'll either air on the, well, we'll air for sure on my website and maybe on Subarus as well. Um, but you know, we can either do a cooking class, or we can just cook together, or we can just go to the farmers market, pick up ingredients, and do. But um, it's really fun. We've gotten some interesting um, entries already. This one I got, which is a crepe, where the person took. Zucchini blossoms. You know how zucchinis take mm. over your garden? Mm-hmm. And so her idea is zucchini aside before the, the flowers turn into zucchini. So she mm-hmm. takes the blossoms, mm-hmm. which we all love to stuff and fry. I mean, mm-hmm. I do that. But she takes them and she cuts them in half and she fans them in a crepe. So you put down the batter, you put the fanned out, you know, halved oh. thing, and then you uh, just turn it over. And it's so it, the pattern of the zucchini blossom. Oh, how lovely. It's gorgeous. So, I mean, I've been getting some exciting stuff or this uh, strawberry ice cream, which is a no cook ice cream. So you don't have to make the custard, which is frightening for everybody. Mm-hmm. It's got five ingredients and then you chill it and then you freeze it and, you know, made with local strawberries and it's strawberry season. So fun stuff. Wait, are, how many recipes are going to put up? Uh, they all go up. They all go And people are supposed to vote. Uh, There's a people's vote, too. Mm -hmm. And whoever wins the people's vote uh, will get all three of my cookbooks signed by me. I mean, Mm -hmm. whoop-de-doo, but it's fun. (laughs) And also, it's nice to have a popular vote. Your cookbooks are great because you can really cook from them. And they've been well-tested. Thank you. And they work. Yes, this is true. So go to Amazon right away and get Sarah's cookbooks. Right. uh, Right. So tell me, your weeknight meals. What's Mm -hmm. your favorite weeknight meal? Oh, gosh. I have one. When I have no ingredients, but I always have broccoli, capellini, chicken broth, and Parmesan cheese. So I make, I call it broccoli pasta. So I take the broccoli, cut it into florets, and I peel the stem and cut it into pieces. And I sort of sear it and skillet raw, and, you know, get nice color on it. And then meanwhile, I cook up some, we all know that angel hair pasta only takes three minutes. And then I uh, add the angel hair pasta to the broccoli along with some chicken broth and finish, you know, we'll try to undercook the capellini, which is hard to do because it cooks so quickly and then it's sort of it's very brothy and I throw in a bunch of parmesan cheese and some hot pepper flakes serve it with crusty bread rush, uh, rubbed with um, I, I, I do this cheating grilled bread I toast it in the toaster and then when it comes out I rub it with good olive oil or brush it with good olive oil cut clove of garlic pinch of sea salt and that's it and everybody loves it for dinner so that's but I also you know what I also love is duck breasts really we, d- we eat them once a week Pecan duck breasts. Okay. I mean, magre is nice, but it's harder mm-hmm. to get, um, mm-hmm. although it feeds more people. But I mm-hmm. do the pecan. Um, How do you do the broil? Or? No, I just skillet them. And I've learned something very nice from our friend, Ariane Degan, which yeah. is duck fat is good for you. Or it's not so bad for you. It has some of the same properties as olive oil. Oh. It's not all saturated fat. Oh. So, but you can take the skin off. I cook it, of course, with the skin because my mm. husband would kill me if I didn't. Mm. But um, you can cook it in, with the skin on and then take the skin off, and it's still delicious. Mm. You can you cook it medium rare. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's as easy to cook as, as steak. I don't know why more people don't eat 
dock breast. I really don't. It's so good. It's, it's not, hard to find, actually. Well, the pecan is easier to find mm. than the magre. Mm. Um, and hopefully, so you, increasingly, it will be. Let's get back to your kids. When yeah. they were growing up, you're such a great you know, home, home cook in that sense. What was their favorite thing to eat? Oh, geez. Not the same thing, unfortunately. You know, I have one of those families where the, my son, my husband eats everything. He's a dream. He loves leftovers. He's a dream. Ruthie really didn't like a lot of meat for the longest time, but she did every vegetable. Artichokes were pretty common, which is interesting. I, I know a lot of kids like artichokes because they're naturally sweet. Oh. Um, Sammy is a carnivore and doesn't like very many vegetables. <laughs> so it was a bit of a challenge. So what I would do is just make sure there was choices on the table, mm-hmm. which included even raw um, red pepper strips, which Sammy would eat, and raw carrot sticks. So we ate very uninterestingly until I think Ruthie was 14 and Sammy was 10 or maybe 12 and 8. My parents took us to Paris for spring break. We ate nowhere special. We just ate at bistros. We made no reservations. I think we ate at one fancy restaurant. Everybody had to dress up. The kids came back eating differently. Completely really? Completely differently. To the point where a couple of years later, I, actually, I guess it was Sammy's 14th birthday. He wanted to have, he hadn't had a birthday party in years. He's like, I want to have a dinner party. I was like, what? He's like, yeah. He invited all his pimply, gawky, awkward boyfriends. <laughs> but I said, okay. We set the table, the whole nine yards, you know, with flatware and candles and flowers and I said so what's the menu he said first course I want to have a choice of either matzo ball soup my husband's Jewish by the way or lobster bisque I was like lobster bisque when in your life have you had lobster bisque he said in Paris with you he Good remembered all those years later. Oh, my God. So it's, it's amazing how I think travel really can change children. It really does. Yeah. So as an educator, we're getting ready to close the program here. Oh, boo-hoo. It's boo-hoo. been fun. And, you know, I know a lot of our students listen to this program. A lot of uh, career cooks, you know, have it playing in the kitchen. So you have any words of wisdom as a teacher and as, you know, one of the most respected women chefs today? Well, I would say, you know, well, obviously, never give up. Don't let anything get in your way, because, boy, I had a lot of things in my way, and I didn't give up. But if you work really hard, you'll, you'll do fine. And one thing Julia always said, and she believed this to the day she died, you never stop learning, ever. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for being here. And I want to shout out to Robin Cohen and Jack Inslee, our producers. And this is Chef Story, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.